Can you see me? Can you see me? Yeah. Can you see me? Do you see me? Very right, good. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a trick question. I'm not invisible, am I? Exactly. But that's what I felt growing up as a kid on the streets, being invisible. That's what I felt. And though I have existed for a very, very long time, I've never been seen. And they are like me who are out there, who are there, but they are not there. They're treated as if they are not there. All of them, in fact, all, this, all these people are invisible. Some choose to be invisible and some are forced to be invisible. Right? Now, this, this is just some stats. Okay? Now, l l let me just give you a story to you. I'm, all of us, we love stories. So let me just tell you a short story of this little boy, of this little invisible boy who started, who is a blank canvas and a blank canvas that the color has never been laid on until he started, he started his education journey. All right? So now, he was... He was, he was born in Penang, in this small place called Subram Prai, which is about 8.7 kilometers away from Georgetown. He was very happy as a, as a growing up child. You know, he, he had a, like, you know, he had a huge space for him to run around the neighborhood because the place was literally empty. And then on the right hand side, there was pond. And then in front there, there was the playground. On the left hand side, literally, his dad's workplace. His dad used to work as a blacksmith. So, yeah, as a child, that's what you would ask. I mean, that's the only thing you would ask for a place to move around. And he had a sister as a companion, as a friend. But, and also he used to stay in one of these containers. Okay, this, this looks a bit fancy. There's like windows over there. Okay, some doors on the side. But the house that he used to stay in, it was just a door. There was just one door to live. And basic, basic science, metal in the afternoon. Metal absorbs heat and it used to be really, really hot in the afternoon. He was staying, so he and his family were staying a decent life, although he wasn't comfortable. He wasn't complaining, neither was his, neither did his sister. But his dad, his mom, they weren't so happy actually. They thought that they, wanted, they don't want to repeat the same cycle of poverty, so same vicious cycle of poverty. So they thought, maybe education, maybe education can bring them out from, can bring out their children from where they are to a better place. So, they took the leap of faith. They took the leap of faith. When I say the leap of faith, it means migrating from the small rural area in Penang to the big city in KL. Now, you see, nowadays, it's really hard for you to survive in a place where you don't really know anyone. But they took the big risk and also being a refugee, being stateless, being invisible, made things harder. So coming to this, coming to KL, they found a job. Oh, they thought, okay, right. So we have a house, we, we, have a, we have a good place to work in. They used to work in the nut factory, cracking nuts every day. But like from what? They used to work two shifts, six hours, six hours, 12 hours, sometimes even more. So as a child, he was very happy because like, you know, he got free food. Like, you know, he didn't eat nuts every day. Sometimes like, you know, he go. <laughs> with his sister and steal the food. But, and also, in the neighborhood that he stayed in, in the neighborhood he stayed in, he made friends with, with the local kids. So he was more happy now. He got more place to move and more people to interact with. But every day, he saw his friends. Parents, his friends' parents, holding the children, holding them, holding the friends, and get them to school. Hold them and get them to school. And this boy, he just like, literally just stand like that, watch them every single day. The parents send them to school, I mean in the van, and also get them, fetch them back when, they, when the van comes. So as a child, you'll be wondering, what's going on? Where are they going? And then his friends will come to him and ask him, hey, why are you not coming, coming to school? It's really fun. Like, you know, we have done this, blah, 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 blah. And he gets excited too. Then he'll be like, wait, wait, why am I not in school? Why am I not going with them? And then he goes back to his dad and he asks, Dad, 
Daddy, 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 well, I want to go to school, I want to go here. You know? See, he says all these things. But the dad, what would a dad reply to a five, to five or six years old child? That you are a refugee, you are a stateless person, you are not entitled to, be, to get a basic education, you are not entitled to get basic medical assistance, you, don't, you are not entitled to get blah, 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 all these things. Do you want to say that? No. So as a dad, he said, only one thing, you are different. Go around and play, that's all. But as he grew up, he started to realize more and more things about himself. That there are so many restrictions that he has to face in his everyday life. And he eventually he found out that he's somewhat invisible. Alright? So, so you see, his parents persuaded so much to, to seek for education for him and for his sister. So they went so many places. And eventually, they found this place called the Unity. There was um, it was this one of the schools like nearby, the, his housing area, not well, so far away. But this is the turning point of his life, the beginning of the journey. The beginning of his journey. To, from being invisible to visibility, to so have the invisibility. So, coming to Dignity, he was really happy. Wow, I see all these children who are just like me. You know, I can be myself, I can just move around and and you have all these teachers who want to guide you. But at the same time, he was struggling because everyone was speaking English except him. Now you see, when you are put in an environment where everyone speaks one language which you are not even familiar to, it, which you have never even heard before, you would be, wait, where am I? Why are they speaking this alien language? Or you have all these things at the back of your mind. But at the same time, it's a good thing. It makes you adapt in the environment. So he said, you know what? It's hard. It's not impossible. So he decided to learn the language. But with, the, with his teachers around him, always being supportive and his friends, he, get, he got influence and he noticed that he can read body language easily. And eventually, about three to four years' time, he started to learn English and he speaks so fluently. Even now, he can speak as if it is his first language. That's not about it. He got the opportunity to play football. He got the opportunity to, for his self-development, for to play, to to cook, to play musical instruments. So basically, things that will develop you as a person. And also, he got the opportunity to perform on stage, to increase, to boost his self-confidence. So as you can see here, it's in his class. Okay, that's him when he's graduating. Okay, so so many things. When so many things he got to learn and so many things he got to do when he was in that school, didn't he? Because it was the platform of opportunity, opportunity and opportunity. For people like him, for those who are invisible. Alright? Alright, okay? So that's him playing the character, the Grinch. You guys know how the um, Grinch stole Christmas? He was playing the character, the Grinch bad guy, the villain who wanted to steal the Christmas. He doesn't like Christmas. He hates Christmas so much. And then that's him over there, number 17. Playing football for his school event called Paisatha, where, where they have annual day. So moving on. Okay, now, he did well in his high school. He did SPM actually, and he thought, that's it, that's it. As a refugee kid, as a person who is stateless, as a person who didn't have all this privilege, he got managed, he managed to finish his education, and he thought, that's it, he's not going to continue anymore, because that's what he was, he was taught to think like from the very beginning of his age, because they thought, he thought that he wouldn't get further in his education life. Then his teachers, Katrina, Pastor Elijah, he said, hey, you know what, you have come so far, why don't you push even more? Push a little bit further. Push yourself a little bit further. I know it was really hard, but eventually I got to Taylor's. He got to Taylor's. See, this is the part where I call for him the discovery of real world. So he was more happy to get to see like people coming from different backgrounds, from different walk of life. But the thing is, the issue is, they come from a very well-to-do, very wealthy background, but at the same time, it's, it's very different than 
the background that he came from. So he was, and then he got shocked. And then he got surprised. He was surprised, and he was like, "Okay, now they are very different than me. So what do I do now? Do I tell them about my identity, or do I, do I keep it as a secret? Because I didn't tell you this, but he got experience one thing before going to DKT. He went to this school called Sekolah Agama. Sekolah Agama, where what happened was during the first day of school." His teacher got him to the class, brought him to the class in front of everyone. He said, "Hey, everyone, this is your new friend. His name is blah blah blah, and he is gonna be your new friend. He's a refugee, so make sure you treat him nicely." And boom, that's it. That one statement that the kids used to pick him on, and started like you know, started not not even allow allow them to allow him to come close to them. Even you know, there was this 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 game in this way. Common in Malaysia, there was this game called Kaja Kaja, where you just like you know run around, chase people. They didn't, they don't, they don't even let you be part of it. So then he realized that he had to move on, and this thing hold held him back from who he really wanted to be. So when he came to realize, he said he didn't want to experience this, and he moved on. And he said, I'm not going to tell them the truth. If someone asks me, if someone asks me who I am, I will just tell him. I'll ask answer a question by uh, by asking another question. Where do you think I'm from? Oh, you, and they say, oh, you look Indian. Oh, yeah, I'm Indian. Yeah, exactly. Then I then he cut the question and he just move on. So, but the thing is, he had a really, a really good time over there actually. So he got to interact with all these people. Although he didn't he didn't tell about the background, he got to mix around with them, mingle with them quite well, and he really made some good friends. Now, that's him before he graduated. All right. And then he decided he want to push himself even more because he already he already crossed the bridge of going to the tertiary education. So he decided, you know what? I'm gonna get my teachers. I'm gonna get Pastor Elisha and Katrina to help me to push me even more and get me to Monash. And that's where he is today. All right? It was really hard. It was it was quite a journey, <laughs> but he got to the journey. He got to the destination. Call it the ultimate destination for him. So he got a scholarship to study there. Okay, no one even imagined that he would get, but he got it because of the support that he got from the people around him and the people who believed in him. I think this is the time for me to tell the truth. He thought he would tell the truth and tell everyone that he's a refugee, despite of what how their response would be. And he started slowly telling them he's a refugee, in, and to his surprise. He was shocked. He was even shocked when they they were so accepting. But they were so they accepted him so well and embraced his identity and his background. And then, because all the negatives thought he was fat before, he never told the truth. Now he's telling the truth. Then you see all the people accepting him. So he even more, he even like participated in so many events. He won the like. Best model, and also you want the Mister and Mister Manash and all these things. See, that's not about it actually. It's about it's about what the opportunity that got in him, how the opportunity got him, how he made use of it, with the people being supportive, with the people believing in him. And then he realized he got so many things in life, but there's one thing that always, always he remembers when he learned in dignity. One thing. When you when you receive so many things in life, it's time to give back. That's rule number six, also from Arun Shadineka, from the six, the six rule of success. He says, give something back. That's why I learned dignity. Give something back. And before going to college, he said, um, he said that I'm gonna I'm gonna do something for them. And over here, you see, by now you would know that it's me, who the person I was talking about, the boy who. Um, So I was talking about the story. It's, it's it's me. Okay. Now moving on about the part that I was telling you about giving something back. So before going to college, he was very um, he was very confused and he didn't know what to do. So he thought he saw these kids running around the street, running around his neighborhood, and thinking, "Hey, you know what? I can do something about them." Because during his time, because during my time, I didn't have anyone to hold my hand to guide me to where I am today. To To, to to show me the right path, and at that time, at this moment right now, these children, these kids, have me. So these people are just like me, actually, who are refugees, who are stateless, who are 
for basically invisible. So I devoted one year of my time to teach them English, maths, and Malay. Now, it was really hard for me because I <laughs> made a vow that I wouldn't teach them. I mean, I wouldn't use my native language to teach them. Instead, I used a lot of body language, a lot of movements, a lot of like, you know, a lot of singing because that's what people get, I mean, that's what makes kids excited to learn more, to make them more curious. So that's the technique that I use. For one year, although it was a very short span of time, I did my best and then, you see, when these kids, by the end of the year, started speaking English, started speaking Malay, and you kind of like get what they're saying, it gives you the ultimate satisfaction. Being, see, only being a teacher, you would understand this feeling, actually. You feel like whatever you're teaching, you get, you, you get, you, get, you probably like, you know, you feel that you have got what you have sold, but you have gotten back. So then, see, every day, every day, we see children like them walking past us, walking past by in front of you every day. But we blindfold ourselves. We blindfold ourselves and just ignore them and neglect them, all these inv invisible children. But there's a silent voice in them saying, will someone ever notice me? Will someone ever bring purpose into my life? Will someone ever color my life? And then, you realize they will be saying, I so want to be noticed. I so want to be noticed that I want to, I want to embrace and I want to encourage others. I want to bring visibility in others' life also. But you see, the thing is, at the end of the day, what really matters is that you playing your part. See, let me tell you something now. They, way back during my time, there was this uh, there was this movie called The Invisible Man from 1930s, about one century ago. So this movie is about um, this invisible man who you can't really see him, but then you can feel his presence when he puts on a glove or when he puts on a shirt. All right, you can feel his presence. So I put on my first glove when I was in first in my in my first year of school. I put on my first socks in my. I mean, in my in my socks in my second year of school, and here I am, fully dressed in front of you be fully visible in front of you today because of education. So it's the education opportunity. So it's, ladies and gentlemen, you can offer something. You can offer them, you can offer them a glove, you can offer them a shirt, or you can even offer them education because education propelled in my life. It got me to where I am today and brought me to this platform. And it's not about those who are invisible, who are pursuing their dreams, it's about those who are visible, who have the voice, who have the visibility. Now the question is, will you say, I will lend my visibility, I will lend my voice, and I am the one who will bring change. And together, hey, you know what, together, let's make it happen. And ladies and gentlemen, I know you can. You can lend your voice, you can lend your visibility, you can share your skills and your gifts to make the invisible seemingly visible, to make the invisible visible. Thank you.